So, as a preliminary to the proof, let's talk about Jens's inequality. Yeah, can I ask? Yes. This uh, distance metric being equal to zero means the previous result you were explaining, like the uh, you can take the unconditional case as the maximum. Yes. Th that's when these are equal. Yes. Two representations. The unconditional case. Yes. You mean this? You you put an inequalities and said that if uh, y was not dependent on the uh, existence of x, you can take h of y as the maximum. Yeah, that's exactly where we're going with this. Actually, we're going to use uh, we're going to use uh, relative entropy to prove this. inequality, we need to talk about convex function. A function is convex over the interval A to B if for every uh, x1 and x2 on that interval and for every constant lambda on the range 0 to 1, then f of lambda x1 plus 1 minus lambda x2 is less than or equal to lambda fx1 plus 1 minus lambda fx2. What does this mean? This is a linear combination of the two x's. This is a linear combination of the two functional results at x. So a convex function looks like this. So, here's my interval of convexity, A to B. And take any, actually, what I mean by that is, these are my two points on the interval of convexity, x1 and x2. A and B are outside of that. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take any linear combination of x1 and x2. Those linear combinations would lie on that line. So this line, this is the line of um, well, what is this line? Here I have f of x1, and here I have f of x2. So this line is the set of all linear combinations lambda fx1 plus 1 minus lambda fx2, where if lambda is 1, then I'm here, and if lambda goes to 0, I end up closer and closer to here. Similarly, the set of all linear combinations of x1 and x2 lie along this line. So. Somewhere along here, I have lambda x1 plus 1 minus lambda x2. So if I, if I pick a particular lambda, I will end up at a particular point along this line. Let's say here. So for a particular value of lambda, this is f of lambda x1 plus 1 minus lambda x2, and this is lambda fx1 plus 1 minus lambda fx2. 
So in other words, if you can think of a convex function as like a closed line, the closed line sags between the two connecting points. Another way to think of it is that if you have a convex function and you are above, if you have any two points above the convex function, then the line connecting those two points, all of those points are inside the convex region. The convex region is up here. Um, another way to think of it, this is due to my friend Josephine, with whom I've written many papers. Um, this is convex. So therefore, this must be concave. And what does this look like? It's kind of like the entrance to a cave. So if you ever forget which way convexity works, remember that this is a cave. Concave looks like a cave. OK. Um, once we know what a convex function is, basically a convex function is one that lies below the connecting line between any two points. So, Jensen's inequality is this theorem. Uh, let f of x a convex function of x. Then the expected value of f of x is greater than or equal to f of the expected value of x. Kind of makes sense. So if you think back to, and this is exactly how we're going to start the proof. Here's a convex function. <coughs> Let's say x can take two values, x1 and x2. The expected value of x, f of x, depending on the probability weights between these two points, would lie somewhere on this line. Whereas f of the expected value of x must obviously lie on, on the function. So therefore, um, if this is the expected value of f of x, this would be f of the expected value of x, which is small. OK. The proof starts out that way. going to do. Uh, this, um, by the way, this uh, theorem holds for continuous random variables, but we will only need it for discrete random variables. So, um, also the proof for discrete random variables is easier, so let's do that. So, what we're going to say is, uh, we're going to prove this by induction. We're going to show that it works if, uh, we're going to prove the base case where x can take two possible values. And then we're going to assume that it works if x can take k possible values. And we're going to show that given that it works for k possible values, it also works for k plus 1 possible values. So by induction. OK, so let's say x can take values x1 and x2, the probability of x1 is p, and the probability of x2 is, what must the probability of x2 be? 1. 1 minus p. There's only two possibilities, and the probability must sum to 1. 